Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. And I am guessing that you watched the Minnesota Vikings lose to the Seattle Seahawks last week by a score of 24 to 13. So did I. We're going to talk about it because there were some interesting talking points coming out of that game, including Ed Ingram. Is he good or bad? Jalen Rager looks like a serviceable wide receiver. And Ty Chandler, my guy, looks to be the lead back for RB2. Welcome to the Real Forno Show. Bornis, the managing editor of USA Today's Vikings Wire, writer for the College Football Network, publisher of Substack Run In Shooter, host of The Good, The Bad, and The Hungry on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network, as well as a founding member of Vikings First and Skull. You are looking live. Well, no, actually, you're looking at a recording. Uh, my name is Tyler Fornis. With me, as always, top right corner is producer Dave. I have a funeral to go to this afternoon, so it is a early recording for us, but we are still excited to talk with you about your Minnesota Vikings. And I, I can see you guys in the comments right now, or I can at least visualize it in my mind. You guys go on absolutely bananas, and I greatly appreciate you guys joining us here this evening. Dave. How are you on this Monday? It's Monday. Yay. I'm doing great. We've got another week of football, but let's get your take on that Thursday night game. And uh, what did you think went wrong with the Vikings in that preseason game? If anything, they had to play third teamers. That's what went wrong. Uh, the third team just did not play well at all. And there were a lot of different reasons why the third team didn't play well. And let's kind of start with the bad. Cause I want to finish with the good. Cause there was quite a bit of it. Let's start with Andrew Booth jr. He is a very interesting player. Obviously he comes out of Clemson. He was hurt the entire time he played at Clemson and was really, really, really good. And then he gets hurt in his rookie season plays less than 200 snaps. Well, that has kind of translated over into his success early on. There hasn't really been any, he was always, a. Uh, I wouldn't say a full blown project, but he needed time and he was raw, but uh, his ability to like cook and close, which is plant your foot in the ground and just explode out of the blocks, kind of like a sprinter. Like that's the kind of thing that you're looking at when you're talking about the click and close. Great. Fantastic. But he also gets a little aggressive and that touchdown by Jake Bobo in the fourth quarter. That was Andrew Booth jr. Getting a little too aggressive and he bites hard on a, Honestly, a really bad fake on a slant because it was a slant and go. He needs to clean that up. But there were some good reps, too. He was aggressive and in tackling, trying to cover the run. I saw a few really good reps in coverage. He's going to take time. And it's a very frustrating process when you have a guy who was picked 42nd overall. We're still talking about him taking time, but did not have much of a rookie season. And that's part of the reason why he was struggling as much as he did, Dave, because there just hasn't been a ton of snaps for him. You got to remember last year during camp, he also got dinged up as well. And I believe that injury occurred in the Raiders preseason game, which was the second of three preseason games for the Minnesota Vikings. So you kind of uh, look at everything all encompassing kind of is what it is. Like it stinks, whatever he's figuring it out and we'll move forward. Uh, from what I get, what I've heard is he has a tendency to bite on bite on routes. When a receiver goes to juke, to plant, to deceive, you know, to shoulder, I'm going this way, and then cuts back, he al he's always been biting on that. And he needs to learn to probably change his, where he focuses on the receiver at that point in time. It's just like when you're coming up to a tackle, a uh, running back or whatever. If the running back's going to put some moves on you, right? You can go with running back, go with the shoulder fake or the, you know, sort of half plant step or whatever it is to get you to bite. Same with a receiver. Watch their belly button. You go where your belly button goes. You're not going to be moving. The belly button doesn't move around that much. Watch the belly button. If he could learn that and not get, sucked in, you know, like a fishing lure, like you're going for Northern Pike up in them lakes, he could be decent. 
and and on that one play versus Bobo, he he bit on Bobo's first move, and that was it. Yeah, and it, that type of aggressiveness is good, Dave, but it has to be harnessed, and I think that's where we just don't have it right now with Andrew Booth Jr. Can we get there? I really believe so. I think he's a very talented player, and I thought he could have been in top 15 pick if he would have been healthy enough to test at the Combine because those testing numbers, I think, would have been absurd, especially that initial burst. Probably has like something like an 80th or 90th percentile 10-yard split just because of how quick he is out of those blocks. But we never got that, and that's one of the reasons why he fell. And the injuries, like he got dinged up in training camp. He missed a week of practice. Look, he gets he's a football player. They all get dinged up, and they're all pushed to the side and be like, hey, <coughs> excuse me, take a minute. Get yourself healed up. It's training camp. No need to rush it. So that's normal. And, but <coughs> it's just extra frustrating when it's a guy like Booth. All right. Sticking in the defensive backfield, how concerned should fans be over Lewis Seen? People need to calm down. And why do they need to calm down? Look, it's frustrating that he's not where he needs to be. At the end of the day, it's okay. Here's why. He's basically in his second rookie season because of uh, how his first one ended up playing out. That's number one. Number two, look, he's figuring it out. It's a slow process. At the end of the day, that's okay. Because uh, like one of the big things here, Dave, not everything was bad. There was some frustrating pieces, but looking at the all 22, like he needs to grow still, but there's a lot of good there. And I wrote about it for the Vikings wire that came out on Sunday afternoon, littered with film clips talking about this exact thing. He's fine. And Oh, the Vikings just made a roster move. They have signed tackle Chim. Okorafor and waved Jackie Chen. So the Jackie Chen era in Minnesota is officially over. And I will Did we even that. see him play? I don't remember his name being called on Thursday at all. I don't either, but this is the like the fourth offensive lineman the Vikings have brought in, in the past two weeks. They are trying to really mess with this depth and see what they can figure out. Um, but I wonder if there's kinda, another injury. Well, if Chen it, was injured or something. It, they just said waived the Vikings um, uh, tw- uh, Twitter account just released it, which means they I don't believe they waived it with injury designation, but I'll click on the article. So they always have something. Yep, no, it's just waived, so it's just not an injury. Made. Okay. Yeah, so big thing was seen. Look, you have to give him time. You have to be patient and that's annoying. It's very annoying, Dave. Nobody wants to be patient with a high draft pick, but he played two defensive snaps last year, and they were literally talking about how they, they're going to start working him in and getting him more snaps, and then he snaps his leg in half. Not the kind of snaps that they were hoping for, let me tell you, but when you pair everything together, it's it just kind of is what it is. And you're looking at a guy who's going on to his second rookie season, and because he's going on to his second rookie season... Like, you have to be patient. And he is a player that is incredibly aggressive, and he needs to learn how to read things better in front of him. And you saw some of that against the Seahawks on Thursday night, where he read a couple things just beautifully and attacked, attacked, attacked. But he's also not reading coverages great. Um, Look, he's not a phenomenal backhand safety, like a deep guy. You're going to want him playing a lot in the box and attacking downhill. That's where you're going to get special stuff. Like there was a play where he blew up a run in the hole, but he couldn't quite finish the tackle and the run went for like three more yards, but he was on the opposite side of the field, like 10 yards back and sprinted across the formation and hit the running back in the hole. That's the kind of stuff that you're going to see out of scene. And those are the special plays that are going to really make him a good football player. It's just going to be tough because there's a lot of nuance behind what he's capable of, where he currently is, and all of the above. So we'll give it time. And that is going to be just a really big thing. And I've already seen a lot of pushback. He's a first-round pick. He shouldn't be given time. Like, I don't think people realize how hard it is to transition to the NFL. 
Like, right. <laughs> what Scene is so good at is just shooting down from the from the backfield, coming in, bang, right, and hitting hitting the gap where the receiver is, where the lo- uh, where the running back is, whatever. He does it so fast. It's just it's a lightning shot, bang. What I saw was poor tackling technique. He's always tackling high. And maybe that worked at Georgia. Just that instant shot, collision, boom, that shock worked. It does not work at the NFL level because those guys are bigger and they know how to take a hit better. And they're just going to bounce off and keep going, which happened on Thursday. So he's got to learn to keep firing like that. But as soon as he gets to the runner or the receiver, break down if they're in front of him, break down and do a proper technique tackle, right? Mm -hmm. Where he's putting shoulder in, he's wrapping the whole works. Boom. He can, if he can learn that, and these are skills that are taught from peewee football on up. If he can combine that with that speed, the ability to absolutely fly across the field, he's going to be special. But he's yep. got to learn that. Without that, he can have all the speed in the world. But if you can't make a tackle, that's you know part of your job on the defense. Yeah, and I, you make a really good point that I was going to transition to here in a minute, and that's the tackling high. Now, here's what we mean by tackling high. When you're a safety, you don't want to attack up here. You don't want to attack the shoulders, the chest. You want to attack the waistline and below. Why? It's all about leverage. It's all about being able to maximize what you have. And attacking a running back or a tight end up here is going to give them the ability to leg drive you away and be able to break that tackle relatively easy. Uh, Think of prime Adrian Peterson. When guys would try to tackle him high, how he would just be able to bounce off of him like a pinball machine. And he'd just be able to keep going and going and going. It's the same construct, the same concept. And looking at that, it, if Seen just goes lower, he'll be okay. And he'll be able to make a lot more tackles. That was an issue at Georgia. And it's an issue now. But I think we're it's something you can fix. It's something you can work on. You don't have to have a, him tackle high for the rest of his life. Like That's something you can fix. It's... It's not a mechanical thing. It's a, hey, just a coach it up thing. And I think that they're going to be able to do that. They're going to be able to figure it out. And I'm not super concerned about him long term right now. Now, if things don't progress and develop, that's a problem. And we're going to have to have that conversation. But he's safety number four in a very good safety room. And I don't think people realize that. I talked about Mataus being a potential cut candidate. He's proven me wrong and good on him. And the coaching staff obviously loves him and they're trying to utilize him in a lot of different ways. But seeing it, it's not about him. It's about everybody else. Everybody else is just playing better football right now. And that's okay. It's We have a deep safety room. Yes. Thankfully. There's other areas of the team we're not deep, but safety we are. All right. Next one talking about bad performances was Ed Ingram's performance as bad as people made him out to be. No. And it's that simple. No. When you look at the film and I clipped 12 plays of Ed Ingram. Yeah. There's still warts. There's still things he has to work on. And there's things that frustrated me that I've had conversations with people about that aren't necessarily a big deal. The biggest thing is Ed Ingram likes to do this thing where he likes to just punch you. And that can that can be a detriment as an offensive lineman. So the punch, it comes like right here on the shoulder and like knocks you back and knocks you off your access. Well, if you miss or it, it gives the opportunity for the defensive lineman to counter you and get past you quicker. So you have to be spot on. And to me, that's a frustrating thing because I would rather you just get him in the clench and be able to win. And that's something Ingram can do really well. Well, he is trying this punch and sometimes it works and he just blows a guy up, but it just looks like he's losing because he's giving the guy an opportunity to counter. So one thing that uh, I was shown was, okay, well, 
when he punches and then they re-engage, where is this guy compared to the rest of the defensive lineman and offensive lineman? Well, Ingram, the ball snapped here. Ingram is here. Everybody else is over here. So it's not as big of an issue. Like, the, like theoretically, it's something I would prefer him not do. But in practice, it's working. And the offensive line struggles were really not an Ingram. There was a little miscommunication. Austin Schlotman did not look very good at all. And Ingram needs to work on some few technical things. I think that's why they gave him a couple drives. Pair that with the injuries they have on the offensive line. Like Chris Reed's still in the NFI list. And they've rotated guys in and out with uh, like offensive line. And as we mentioned a co- few minutes ago, they just signed another one and, and waved Jackie Chen. Like they're they're just trying to f- get through the preseason. And uh, honestly, Ingram looks fine. I think he's going to be much improved this year. Is he great? No. But could he be average? I really believe so. I don't think he's going to come close to the pressures that he met, allowed last year, which was 63. Yeah, he'll probably average, he'll probably allow something like 40. And 23 less pressures, Dave, is a lot. That's a and, lot. And that would put him in the middle ranking of guards if he did that yeah. when it comes to pass pro and allowing pressures. And we already know his run blocking is good. So mm-hmm. that would greatly increase. I think it was... Uh, who was it? It was Matthew Collar said, if he could get rid of one a game, one mistake a game, he would be middle of the pack. If he can get rid of two, he'd be very, very good. And can that be done? Yes, it can. That comes with coaching and working on it and doing all the other stuff that we hope tapped it, especially over the off season, that we see that as it comes to fruition when the whole offensive line is out there. And the only time we're going to be able to see some of that is this week as the Titans come in for a joint practice. Yeah, I'm really excited to see uh, how he does against a guy like Jeffrey Simmons Mm -hmm. because that's going to really show what kind of growth and development he has. And those practices will be Wednesday and Thursday this week. Next week, the Arizona Cardinals come to town for Wednesday and Thursday afternoon practice. Those will be at TCO at noon, not 2.30. So something to be aware of as you continue to uh, keep tabs on the Minnesota Vikings. I will say this. I think Ed Ingram is going to be fine. Now, we'll see how things continue to maneuver and develop because that is, that's a big thing. And it's, it's going to be really intriguing to see. Um, let's, there's a couple more guys I really want to talk about. And then we're going to get out. What did you think of Jalen Rager? And will he still make the team? Rager looks like an NFL wide receiver. And I couldn't say that last year. He looks legit. He looks like a very rosterable player, a guy that you could trust to run the proper route. That's not something we said last year. And (laughs) it's not something he did last year either. No, that Indianapolis Colts game was an absolute adjunct disaster. Dave, he, the two routes that he ran resulted in two interceptions. One of which was returned for a touchdown. That's a problem in this game. He had four catches for 55 yards. He was running crisp routes. Uh, He, and I highlighted six of them including he ran an out route against cover three, which was just great. He created a lot of separation, did the toe drag. Look, Rager looks like an NFL wide receiver now. And I wondered how much of it just had to do with the Philadelphia Eagles and whatever issues were going on with him and that coaching staff in front office. And then obviously the fan base is every fan base is hardcore, but there's a difference when you're talking about Philadelphia versus anybody else. Like there's the whole mantra. They booed Santa Claus. They were throwing full beer cans at children when we went to to play them in the 2017 NFC championship game. It's just a different level. It's an, it's an animal. And he comes here at the end of training camp. Doesn't really have a chance to assimilate with the offense. They kind of use him a little bit here and there, but alas, they, it was just a struggle. And 
he made a lot of mistakes. It looks like an entire offseason with the team has kind of cleaned some of those up, and he looks like a player that you could trust, I don't know, run like 10, 12 routes a game and try and make an impact with some of that speed and open field ability. So he that pairs with a good camp. Every day I've seen him, he's looked good. Not phenomenal. He's still Jalen Rager. Like there's still going to be some limitations there. And obviously it's hard to undo three years of mid, but he looks good. And I highly recommend you go check that piece out and kind of see what he's doing and why it's different. That in my opinion is the reason why like he could genuinely make the roster, not just because the 2.42 million is guaranteed no matter what, but earn it by merit. He's playing well. All right. Our next player is the mad scrambler, your draft crush, Jaron Hall. What did you think of his performance? I'm, I came out of it very neutral and people would be like, oh, he was terrible. Like, why? Why was, why did it look terrible? Why was he struggling? Well, let, let's, it's a myriad of factors. There were some where, he made poor read. He wasn't processing fast enough. That's been an issue. That's an issue for a lot of rookie cornerbacks. They need time. They need time to adapt. They need time to grow. They need to figure out. And they need to... What's the word? Like They just need reps. They need to play against players in live game action. And that's to me, that's what's really important here. He just needs time and he's, he's being given that now. Um, like he's playing with third stringers, the offensive line, third string off is atrocious. Uh, the receivers were not helping him whatsoever, but he also didn't help himself a lot. And overall, I, I gave his performance like a C C plus, like you have to contextualize everything. And the offensive line wasn't good. The weapons weren't good. The play calling was incredibly basic and vanilla. They weren't really trying to, they were just running plays and that's what preseason is. And that's what can make some of these um, really difficult on an overall level. Like it's, you just have to be patient with hall. He's got to figure it out. He's going to develop. And once he does, I'm really excited, but nothing about what we saw is anything more than like, he's just a rookie figuring it out. He's fine. Um, I, go to, I, I, did broke like his... one, I broke down every single one of his dropbacks for Vikings wire. And mm-hmm. you could see what happened, why things occurred the way they did, whose fault it was. And I graded each one. Uh, a few of them got D's, but a couple of them got A's, including that 19 yard fade route. That was just perfectly thrown from Jaron Holden and Keel Harry. It's not all bad. I did like his scrambling abilities. That is good mm-hmm. to see. That will yes, help in it, the future. Yes, absolutely. He can move. He he's got the he's got the ability, man. He really does. And I I like it. I like what he's able to do. But we got to see him with better players. We got to see him with a little less of a vanilla playbook. And we want to see how he grows from here. To me, that's what's most important. He didn't come out and just look like so bad that he's unrosterable. That was Kellen Mond. And Hall Hall looks has showed some ability. And can you grow that? Can you fix what's poor and grow what's not? Like There's so many layers to this. Give him time. He deserves the time. And we'll figure it out moving forward. I agree. What what can we expect this week against the Titans that translates from last week? What carries over from the loss against the Seahawks to the upcoming game against the Titans, specifically for the four, these four individuals we just just discussed? You want to? You we now have a baseline for what they are. Now let's see how they're going to grow week to week and how they're going to be able to stack performances. How are they going to look after they go see the game film and then try to play better? I think that's, that's the biggest thing here, Dave. It's 
How are you growing? Are you fixing what's not going well? Those questions are the, the ones that need to be answered because everybody's going to struggle. Like the first time out is arguably the worst and the one you really need to throw away the most. If Lewis seen balls out in game two and Jaron Hall balls out in game two, let's say Ed Ingram is just a, an abysmal player. Like it's like, okay, then it's like a scientific method project. All right. Come with the hypothesis then you gather data and then you gather more data. And now you have data and that either coincides or rejects your first data. And you have to kind of look into why. And it's not all just about one thing. It's about the whole picture. And the more info you have, the better off you are at making decisions. And that's why I think the Kwesi Dofo Mensa era has a real chance to be successful because they are patient and they are looking at so many different avenues of data. And that is really important when you're having these conversations. You have to be able to to look at multiple aspects of data. And I think that we're going to see a lot of growth, but I also think we're not going to see any first teamers in the next two games because they're going to be doing these joint practices. And I think we're going to see a lot from the second team and that's going to really paint another picture for us. No, I agree on that. They're going to be in the joint practices where it's more controlled. They're not necessarily taking guys to the ground. There's less chances of injury. They're getting their reps, but they're not going to play during the actual games because that, that'll be second and third stringers. And that's where the almost where you want it to be because you want, yes, are the first stringers getting tuned up ready for the season? Yes, they are with the joint practices. During the other, during the games, you're getting to evaluate your bottom end of your roster. Who are you going to keep? Who are you going to cut, right? Who has promise, even if, you know, may not have played well, but you're seeing something. I I might want to stash this guy on the practice squad, whatever. That's where the games are going to come in valuable to us as fans to see, to look at those individual players, because don't expect the third team offensive line to do great. They, They can't. It's just they don't have the communication down. They don't have the time down. They don't, even if an individual player does great blocking, right? He doesn't, it's not a cohesive unit. You're not going to get a cohesive unit until we're back to regular playing football. So you want to look at the individual, see if they grow. You want them to grow. See if they take coaching well. You want them to take coaching well and see how they perform. Yeah, I, I'm really excited to kind of see how this team continues to grow because honestly, that's the big thing. It's about seeing the growth and being able to kind of talk about it. And we're going to be able to do that a lot here on The Real Forno Show. And it's it's going to be really interesting to see how things play out. I'm very excited about it. And I know Dave is as well. Like, there wasn't a ton to gather from this game just due to the fact that, you know, it was what it was. But I want to talk about one thing before we head out of here today. Ty Chandler looked really good. and. Kevin O'Connell spoke about after the game. He's like, look, we're not always seeing this in practice, but it was great to see it in a live game. So I would say with everything going on right now that uh, Chandler is probably your num- uh, lead guy for RB2. And I think that's well-earned, well-deserved. But there's a lot of moving parts here, and I'm intrigued to see how it all plays out. Well, it looked like uh, Nwangu was was the number two. Now, that comment that Coach said, you know, rang some flags. It's like, all right, Chandler's showing it on the field under the lights. He did that last preseason, too. He looked good. And Mm -hmm. he showed it, obviously, on Thursday. I thought he had a great game, especially when it came to his pass blocking. He didn't miss the pass block. But is he just the guy that plays great under the lights and doesn't practice well? And if it's not practicing, why isn't he practicing well? Because he should be. And if he starts practicing well, like it suddenly he's clicked that during practice he can do those things. And it's, I mean, a lot of his stuff is he's so hard to take down. Most of his runs, he got past the first defender. Well, in practice, you get the defenders doing the two-hand touch thing, the tap, and I got you, right? And there's no... 
There's no realistically, well, you didn't try to take me down. You're not going to take me down. So I can't show anybody that I can blow through you because I'm technically down because you touched me. It's it's going to be interesting to see if he t- if he cranks it up just a bit this week. If we start to hear Coach say, no, he's getting it in practice now too, what we want to see. I hope we do. And then he'll s- s- easily solidify that. RB2 slot because Ken A is missing in action. Yeah, he's got a boo-boo of some sort and can't make the team in the tub, as they always said. Now, Ken A probably will make the team, but if you're if you can't practice and you can't play, you're no good to the Vikings. Bingo, bango, bongo. And that's going to be really interesting to look at moving forward and see how things continue to grow and develop with this running back two spot. It's going to be interesting, especially because we're expecting the running back to be a committee approach this year. And mm-hmm. I'm excited to see how it plays out. But that's going to be it for today. Uh, a really interesting game against the Seahawks. And we're going to come back on Wednesday talking about the game against the Tennessee Titans, which I believe is Saturday night, correct? I think it's Saturday. I haven't looked. Yeah. I can look. Hold on. Saturday, Saturday. Schedule. Boink. Saturday night, 7 p.m. Central. Saturday night's all right for fighting. And we'll be mm-hmm. here on Wednesday to talk all about it. Thank you very much for tuning in. Sorry it wasn't live, but family comes first. And I appreciate you understanding that. From Dave, I'm Tyler. One thing we always say, Skull Vikings, baby. Skull Vikings! Like, subscribe, and ring the bell to get notifications. It helps us grow this community that we all love our Minnesota Vikings. And on behalf of Tyler Fornis, And myself, Dave Stefano, thank you so dearly for watching The Real Forno Show. Skull, everyone!